Okay, we're back live here in Silicon Valley in Santa Clara Convention Center. This is the future of networking. This is ONS 2014, Open Networking Summit. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with my co-host for this segment, Stu Miniman, the chief analyst at Wikibon on networking. And our next guest, CUBE alumni, tech athlete, Martin Casada, chief architect and networking at VMware. I wonder if he still has the Nasera business cards, um, but uh, great to have you back. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. You guys are up on stage, you had like two minutes to talk about the future of SDN Cloud. <laughs> it felt like two minutes, but the audience was very engaged, their heads were spinning, there was some good Q&A. Yeah. Clearly one of those sessions where you needed more time, right? Yeah. People were interested. Oh, you were trying to summarize a very complex topic in a very short time frame. So, one, did you, were you amped up? And two, what did you leave out? <laughs> uh, what, what did you miss? What, what could you have done better? What, what, what's your take of your own presentation? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, it's such an exciting topic. And what's exciting to me about it is I think over the last year, we've kind of moved from um, you know, largely kind of theoretical, almost motherhood and apple pie discussions around things like software and um, openness to you know, products on the ground and how people are, are using it. And so my talk was, like, wow, you know, we've, we've now built things and people are using them and it's capturing the imagination and, and, and what does that mean? And so, um, I mean, I enjoy talking about that. It turns out that things like network virtualization really do capture the imagination. They're being pushed into areas we've never seen before. And so, you know, as I talk about it, I get very excited, and I didn't have the time that I wanted to to go through all of them, but I think like the, the core message was there. You, you were talking about things like edges, edges using slides you were borrowing. It's so hard to give a presentation around virtualization without you know, having all the right pictures and the old router you know, components, all the old you know, slideware stuff. Yeah. So I got to ask you, uh, in our previous talk at VMworld, you talked about creativity, new dawn of you know, with software virtualizations, SDN, yeah. but now we're hearing, this is really the beginning of the infancy of a revolution. Yeah. We're seeing on the data that we're capturing from the crowd and the commentary, uh, DevOps culture yes. of cloud is really a forcing function down the stack and saying, hey guys, get your act together on the networking side yeah. where you have the, that DevOps mindset, now you got operating systems kind of theory yeah. at the network level, yeah. and then you got what's going on at the virtualization at the network, both logical design principles and then deployment into the cloud. So all those things are happening. Yeah. One, I want to get your take on those things, yeah, yeah. and what is the real deal that's happening that, that, that's in, in virtualization or SDN in particular that's, that's really provable right now. You're saying, hey, this, that's got traction, check, and what are the work areas that need to be improved? Okay, sure, so I'm going to split up my answer into two parts. So the first one, I'm just going to address this issue of like, you know, if you step back, what are the drivers behind it? So I, I, I actually think if you look at the SDN space, say, say this is the SDN space, you've got kind of two drivers. There's a customer use case driven driver, which is basically, I've got business to accomplish, and the business is driving requirements and infrastructure, and I'm going to push that down and require you, the vendors, to build stuff to make, let me do my business, right? And so this is, I think it's the less creative, very practical, I need to get job X done to make money, I manufacture cars, networking is in the way, this is how that you should be able to change it. And a lot of the discussions around that, and this is how we evolve an industry, but at the same time, there's this kind of very exciting creative chaos that's happening bottom up, which is you get developers and technologists and you put them in a room and you're saying, listen, you know, actually, forget the business cases. Like, we know that they're out there. We know we're going to solve real problems. But like, listen, now we have software, we have abstractions. Why don't you come up with technologies that are, that are elegant um, and general and maybe solve problems that nobody's thought of together? And so we got this kind of mix of both worlds. We've got this very, practical, let's solve business cases, and then we've got this kind of alternative, let's be creative and come up with things nobody's come before, and I think it's kind of a best of both worlds. Do you see the, um, 
the, the incumbents, we were talking on the intro segment, Stu and I, you have the old incumbents, like the Cisco's of the world, the Juniper's, the HP's, you have the new incumbents, the VMware's, and maybe some Series D funded startups that may or may not make it. Um, and then you have the startup community, which is now still innovating. So you have three kind of sets of players, right? Um, so the issue is, who's going to be disrupted and who's going to be disrupting. So all three players have to make that offensive move right now. So tie your creativity chaos bottoms up into what needs to happen, what's, who's at risk, and what's your take on all that, who gets disrupted and who's be disrupting, and what does it take to disrupt? You know, I, I think that is the question, and I've kind of sort, sort of pulled myself out of the prediction <laughs> game, because I think it's very difficult to know. But, but I, I do think I can say something concrete, which is, a lot of the movement in the SDN space over the last, say, 10 years has been about decoupling layers to provide horizontal integration, which means that you have more competition at every level, right? You have competition at the hypervisor space. You have competition at the physical hardware space. And so as you disaggregate, as you have competition in the physical hardware, you know, these food fights occur. And what happens as a result is from a customer standpoint, you get optionality, you get you get more that you can buy from, um, but also you know, prices drop, things become more general. So I think we're going to have this huge food fight. I think there's going to be a lot of collateral. I think there's definitely going to be change. Like we feel the heat now, but as to who's going to win, I don't know. I mean, I think that the large incumbents, there's a lot they can do with the channel, with the customer shipping product position to maintain position. But if they can't get out of their own way, you know, maybe those that are more established but aren't as new, or maybe one of the new guys will kind of you know, take the pieces of everybody else once they've killed each other. So I think it'll be exciting to watch. There will be change, but it's too early to know who's going to Stu, Stu, before you go there, I want to ask one more thing. So we had an open source conversation earlier on with yeah. the chief science of Brocade. And he had a quote that said, it's not, it's, it's how you build something is actually more important than what you build. In the old days was the product itself. So with open, open source being such a fundamental role in the, in the raw materials and the creativity, what's your take on that? I mean, the processes and the standards and the, and the openness of that, uh, what, what, how you build it versus what you build. You talk about a lot of different things going on with the decoupling and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, open source is such a complicated topic for me. Like, I've kind of lost my Pollyannic view around it, meaning, I think you can get in just as much trouble with open source as you can with closed source. I mean, whether it's because you have one person that's committing, whether because whoever adopts it doesn't have the developers or the domain expertise to evolve it, because you have to go through a community to solve business problems. I mean, it's you know, open source is great. It's great from a community perspective. It's great from a framework perspective, but it's got its own issues. And so, I mean, I, I think that we're going to live or die by open interfaces, meaning that whether it's open source or not, and open source is great and it should always be an option, I think we should all make sure that we're horizontally composable. That is, you should be able to mix and match parts to systems so whoever it is can choose, I want something open source, I want something from this vendor, I want something from this vendor, and they can mix and match. So I'm much more now about making sure we have horizontal composition, we have open interfaces and we stick to those, and then when it comes to open source, I think we have to evaluate that in a case by case basis because, I mean, there's a lot of precedence in the industry for it causing as much issues as closed source systems. And so, again, I think it's great, I think it's healthy in certain places, but I think it's a little bit Pollyannic to assume that we can kind of, um, it's the, 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 the only solution for different environments. So, so, so Martin, yes. you know, first time we did an interview with you right after the Nicira acquisition, I mean, you were banging on the table how open source was going to completely transform, you know, networking and, you know, you know, change the change the table here. Um, to be honest, some of the community, you know, pushes back and says, you know, VMware, you know, absolutely, you know, is, is involved in the open source community, you know, no doubt heavily involved in OpenStack, but, you know, to hear your answer now, it, it, it sounds, you know, definitely like you're pulling back some. Um, so, you know, can you speak to VMware's commitment to the open source community uh, and, you know, kind of, you know, how, you, how you, the statement that you just yeah. kind of fits with what VMware's strategy yeah. is? So actually, so VMware is actually, uh, I mean, we've doubled the number of developers on every open source project. We've probably contributed more than we've ever contributed before. So I think VMware as a company is, I mean, I mean Pivotal is all open source. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of work on the open source community. I mean, I think that software and open interfaces are definitely going to change networking, for sure. I think open source is going to be an enormous driver behind that. And like, you know, I mean, I, I've started yet another open source project that's totally open, that's called Congress and OpenStack. So, I mean, I keep starting ones, I mean, you know, Open vSwitch, we started early on. 
Quantum, we started after that. I just started one called Congress. So I believe that open source is very important. I believe it's a catalyst. And VMware has supported me the entire way, right? If you look at the number of lines of code we've committed to OpenStack on all areas, continue to commit to the Linux kernel over Open vSwitch. Like, like, the commitment is clearly there. Actually, if you stack is against most other companies, I mean, the contribution's enormous. I just, I just feel that we need to make sure that our conversations are on something that makes it better for the ecosystem. And I think that making it just about open source belies the reality that it's really about composability that gives us freedom, right? I mean, if I do open source, I can still lock you down in a support model. I yeah. can, right? I mean, there's a lot of business things you can do to still make things close. So yep. just because hardware vendor X does open source or hypervisor vendor X does open source doesn't mean they're necessarily doing the right thing. So we think we need to make sure everybody sticks to open interfaces. A absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the attack on open source in general is, you know, open source is free, like a puppy. So, <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you need to be careful there. So, uh, you know, at this show, uh, there's a lot of talk about the various projects. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've talked before about OpenFlow and, you know, that doesn't fit into, you know, VMware strategy so much today. Uh, Open Daylight's been a large part of, uh, of the community here. Yeah. Um, I, I know VMware is supportive, but not, you know, the largest uh, contributor there. Um, now that Hydrogen's out, you know, what, what's your take on Open Daylight and how that fits into the ecosystem? Yeah, so I, I think open source controllers are great for SDN in general, especially those that try and solve a number of problems as a base platform. Now, whether, you know, I mean, I think we released the first one with Knox. Um, whether it's Beacon or Floodlight or Tremor or Open Daylight or whatever, I think this is great. I think the more support and chaos in this, the better the industry is, for sure. But I think it's a mistake to conflate the notion of a general platform with a product. And like, I've worked on four controllers. I think I built the first two when I was at Stanford, and then I worked uh, one at, uh, and two at Nasira, right? So I've, I've worked on four different controllers. It's an interesting space. I like working at it, but like, Personally, my arc is now about how do you take these technologies and solve new problems, not how do you focus into the technologies themselves. And so like my personal arc is a little beyond how do you build a good controller and more now how do you address different technical problems, whether they're long-standing problems in networking or whether they're long-standing customer problems. I mean, that's kind of where I've gone. So I'm very supportive. I think it's great that they're out there. I think it's great that there are many that they're out there. Um, um, but you know, in general, like the, my view is kind of a little bit higher level these days. Sure, th th this is a personal thing. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. And you know, your your part of the community is is, is not doubt at, at all. I'm wondering if you can give us the update. What are you seeing with the customers you're talking today? Um, you know, la last time we talked, you know, we said it, it was rather early. It's still the really large companies. Uh, if you take this show as an example, you know, you look at AT and T and NTT yeah. and you know companies with you know uh, infrastructure budgets that are over a billion dollars a year. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, you know, of course, that's not the typical uh, company. Uh, what, what are you seeing out there sure. in the adoption of, uh, you know, SDN, network virtualization yeah. and the like? Yeah, so kind of kind of, kind of taking off my kind of, you know, general gadfly hat and kind of putting more on a VMware hat, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the field and I think kind of the last year was kind of an inflection point. We actually had an earnings call recently where we talked about this, where we, we had a number of wins of an SDN solution, which is network virtualization across verticals. And so we had, we had retail, we had large financials, we had telcos, we had Midwest manufacturing, we had airline companies. And so I think that we're getting close to the point of crossing the chasm. And as a technology, so I think that's cool from an industry maturation perspective and a consumability perspective. Um, but as a technologist, what I find the most fascinating is as this gets pushed into production, it captures the imagination. And it's getting pushed into areas to solve problems that certainly I didn't conceive of initially. And that's why I'm so interested in looking at like, how does this hit the problem space and solve problems and how are people using it and how can we involve it to make it better do that. So that's where a lot of my focus is these days as a technologist. Talk about what's changed in the landscape. I mean, I know you like to say at a high level in the presentation you didn't have a lot either, but like clouds on, on of it. So since our first interview two years ago to now, what is, and you mentioned your arc has changed on a personal level, you've written control list now, composite apps or composite uh, of APIs or whatnot. Um, but share with the folks out there the Mark, Martin view of what's changed in the landscape. A lot of action certainly happening. People are finding their swim lanes, so to speak. Um, what's your take on what's changed since all the big, Honestly, this is, a, this is a great question. So, I, I, I think the battle is no longer about networking 
architectures, and I don't think the battle is between products or startup. I actually think what we're seeing is a positioning of this arc battle between three IT architectures. I think like the entire discourse has up-leveled to IT, and I think there are three visions that are being espoused. One vision says IT, not networking, all of IT should have a hardware basis, and it should be vertically integrated. There's another vision that says IT should have a software basis, and it should be horizontally composed. And I think there's another vision which says IT should be only consumed as a service. And I think from a macro industry perspective, all of this kind of discussions about networking and storage and software and that is actually being consumed by this mega level grab for IT and the future architecture of all of IT. And so I think this is kind of getting a lot larger than, than most of us and is becoming the positioning of the Titans. And so for me, it's kind of exciting to kind of see this. You know, is, is it coming from the, um, the vendors, the customers? Yes. Is it the developers, all three? I, I think it's largely a stratification in the products available, the vendors behind them, and the consumption model, which is you know, vendors that have margins tied to hardware will say IT should be vertically integrated and it should be driven by hardware. Vendors that are primarily a software model say it should be a software-defined thing and I should ship it to you as software. And vendors that provide IT as a service say, you know, you should consume your data center over your internet link and I will run it for you. And from a customer perspective, the macro level messaging is not about, you know, should it be open source this or should it be, you know, X project that or should it be cloud this. It's really, how do you consume your IT? Are you going to buy it as a shrink wrap hardware product? Are you going to buy it as software you can run on general compute? Or are you going to use it as a service? And that is the battle that's going to play out in the next 10 years. Which everyone's saying it's not going to be one of, they're all not mutually exclusive, but it's all hybrid. That's essentially what we're, what we're hearing. Yeah. In, in whatever use case, you plug it in. Yeah. Does that make the argument for well, composite I mean, apps? Yeah, and the question is, is you, you take the slider bar and you slide it out to the future, and where's the convergence point? And I think some arguments will say it all turns into the Googles and Salesforces and Amazons. Like, everybody will consume it from the cloud. Others will say there will always be a hardware element on premise, and I think others will say it's actually going to be general purpose hardware for software. And I think there will always be a balkanization, but I do believe there'll be a true winner. Yeah. Now, it'll, be, it'll, it'll not be 100% market share, but I do believe there'll be a monopoly Well, winner. we were just speculating about hyperscale, saying you know, Facebook's Google and Amazon, they'd built their own because they had smart people who could do it, and they saved a boatload of cash by doing it themselves, but you go to an enterprise, they might not have the smart people to build it, so they'll buy a premium. So maybe well, that's well, consumption so, but, angle. But this is the interesting question. So, so from an enterprise customer, should they buy somebody else's software to build their own cloud, or should they just consume the service that they wanted initially as a service, right? So is it are they building their own data center using somebody else's software, or instead of building a data center, are they getting that data center as a service? And like that's a that's an open question. Yeah, absolutely, and that's where hybrid fits in, of course. Everybody's doing a little bit of each. They've got their SaaS, they've got their internal stuff, and they've got their and you know that that air gap that we see, of course, is the apps. It's there's some apps that are real easy yes. to move, and there's you know, and if you're building new apps, that you know all the gaming guys are all in the cloud. That's you know, right. They and, need and to be flexible. Right. But it's the mobile guys. Exactly. You know? No, exactly. But it, it's such early days. I yeah. think it's it's too early to predict what the convergence is going to be. Right. And like, there's so many forces on this. There's channel forces. There's you know sunk assets on customer prem. There's sales motion. There's there's certification. All of these forces are either impeding the movement away or, or accelerating the movement away. And so he's got this very dynamic system that's a feedback loop that we're all trying to predict what it's going to converge on. I think yeah. it's early, but I think that is the question. It's a macro question about IT and well, the model for IT. The thing that we were speculating um, last at our last event in Vegas was if the consumerization trend happens, you have an accelerated traction model, meaning like WhatsApp was successful because it could be quickly. Apps fail all the time, so the, the point of failure defer, determines quickly what's accepted, so that's one element. And the other element is the platform. You got to have an enabling platform, so it backs down to the what's under the hood. So if you look under the hood, if you're an enterprise or you're in networking, you got to have a core stable platform to build on, right? So that's, you can't just say, here's my approach and hope it works. You can't just you know, mail that in, if it doesn't work, then everything else fails. So you have you know, these, these forces. So the question is to you, uh, on the networking side, as SDN maps directly into software-defined data center, what is being tooled right now in, main, in, in real time that's the most critical elements uh, that you can talk to this, say, to the folks out there not paying attention to the, in the weeds, the most important elements of, of SDN mapping into software-defined data center? So I think that there are 
I think I, I actually think that the primary model of SDN today is taking intelligence that you would normally put in the network and rewriting applications to consume it. And this is not like the traditional model of SDN where you're you have a central controller and you're changing the control model, but it's basically saying the network, there's not a lot for it to do in the data center, especially in the data center, and instead you can do it in the applications. The problem is, is the only way you can realize that architecture, which is by far the most successful architecture from a precedent standpoint, is if you own the applications, right? So I think this is a very interesting question, which is if you can't rewrite your applications, how do you get these types of benefits? Do you buy them from somebody else that can write their applications? So instead of running your own applications, you buy somebody else's as a service. Do you go to a company like VMware and you get a translation layer that allows you to run your own applications um, uh, on existing hardware and it will provide a virtual translation service? Or do you just continue to run the old infrastructure? I mean, I think that this is the dynamic I see playing out within the data center. I think that the, the classic view of SDN is like a, a decoupled control plane. I think it's part of implementing those solutions, but from like a customer standpoint, the network comes down to exactly that question, which is, do I rewrite my applications? Do I have a, a software layer that does a translation for me, or do I not change? So Martin, I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of insight as to, now that NSX is out, yeah. you know, how broadly and widely is the networking team inside VMware impacting other products in the VMware portfolio oh, and the federation? Yeah. So, you know, you have vCloud Hybrid Service, you mentioned Pivotal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, VMware of course has lots of partners, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Where, where are you guys, you know, spending your most time strategically? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So from an organizational perspective, we touch everything, whether it's VCHS or it's the core or even like VCAC and the consumption model, like like this is like the, you the don't talk to those EMC guys, do you? The we actually ask the storage on the EMC side. I mean, we touch everything. And so, um, so all of these discussions go on as far as compatibility, as far as integration. Uh, personally, I've actually moved on to doing a lot of security work. And so a lot of the work that I do using network as a basis is looking at the problem of security. And I'm not sure if you've seen kind of recent stuff I've done on the Goldilocks zone, but I actually think there's a whole new effort and attempt to kind of revolutionize the security space in a very similar way. And so that's kind of my, you know, one of the areas that I'm personally very invested in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in your keynote this morning, you said that 40% of the customers that were yeah. buying network Shocking. virtualization were doing it because of security. And, all, and like, honestly, I would not have predicted this uh, originally, even though like that was the genesis of the work I did at Stanford was security. Actually, you look at my first paper, it was a security architecture. Like, it turns out, like, this is why people are adopting it. And so, like, this is kind of like, I'm personally very invested these days into the security space. Talk about the Goldilocks zone, <laughs> okay? If you could share your opinion on that. Yeah, okay, so what is the Goldilocks zone? So, um, so, so here's the rough idea. So, if you look at the security industry, um, security spend actually outpaces IT spend as a trend, and the only thing outpacing Security spend is security losses. And so I think there's an architectural issue. And the way to, de to describe that architectural issue is, today when we push security controls out there, we either get rich context or we get isolation, but we never get both. So if we put security controls in the application, we get all the context we need. We get who's logged on and what data is being accessed and how it's being accessed. But you're in the trust zone of the application, so a malware can turn it off. If you put security controls in the infrastructure, you're very well isolated, you're in a different attack uh, or a different trust zone, but you have no context. And so the Goldilocks zone says, actually the hypervisor is in this very unique position where it's close enough to the application to have context, but it's far enough away to actually be, in a, in, to be isolated. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. And so I'm working on a large platform initiative to enable partners to use that layer to provide both context and isolation in the security product. So the, the term was coined in NASA in the 70s <laughs> yeah. to describe the simultaneous things that need to be in place to sustain life on a planet. Yeah, not too so hot, not that, too cold, right? That's so, right? You know, it's a balance, it's an ecosystem, an ultimate ecosystem life. Yeah. But in a way, that comes back down to the platform viability issues, right? There's so many things in yeah. place. It's not about one or two dimensions, right? It's a lot of different elements. Right. So interesting. So where, where are you in the project? You wrote a blog post two days ago about this, or I think yesterday about this. What was, uh, what it, wh where is the stage of this project? Right, so, so the ultimate idea is to enable the security ecosystem to build on a platform to imbue their products to have rich context and isolated enforcement. And this cuts across kind of, you know, all areas, well, many areas in security, whether it's vulnerability assessment, or it's next generation firewall, or it's antivirus, or it's network access control. I mean, like any of these will actually benefit from this type of approach. And so we've, we've 
we actually have a number of, of, of systems that are in production today built on this. As proof points, we've got an, some uh, pretty core technology that's been developed over the last year, and we're generalizing the architecture going forward. So this is far more than a blog post at this uh, point. There's actually a lot of proof points behind it, but it's still it's early about generalizing this and really enabling the ecosystem. So that's kind of where I'm working on now. We're getting short on time here, but I want to get that out there. I mean, security obviously a big part of it. You heard services. So uh, everything as a service is, is a big term, um, and that's one a philosophy. But with cloud uh, and, and all these under the hood examples, there's still a lot more innovation. If you take the Goldilocks projects as an example, huge innovations. I always, I always ask you on theCUBE here, What's your view for entrepreneurs? You've been a, a startup entrepreneur coming out of Stanford, very well depth in, in a domain expertise. Folks out there that are watching this infancy of a revolution of massive change, great innovation is upon us. What would you share with the folks out there would be your view on what to look at, what to sink your teeth into, what to pay attention to. Uh, just share the, yeah. share the love. Well, I'm, you know, I mean, it's something that I think about a lot Clearly, and, 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 and these days I spend a lot of time actually exploring the startup ecosystem from a partnering perspective and a strategic perspective from within VMware. And so much, and like chaos is opportunity, and there's a lot of chaos, and, and, and ergo we've got a lot of opportunity, but so much of, of infrastructure is just about insertion. And so as you're exploring interest, and as you're exploring these changes, make sure that you understand how technology is inserted, not just technically in the stack, but at a market and an organization level. Because without that, you can build the best technology on the planet, you can take advantage of all the buzz and the hype, but you really can't get these things deployed. And at the end of the day, I think that that's as important as core, core technology. Yeah, so Martin, along that lines, I'm wondering, you know, talking to all the customers that are looking at this technology, is there something they can do to move this forward faster, or something that's you know the, the you know is it just inertia? Is it you know the organizational structure? You know how how do how can the user community uh, you know move this way faster? Honestly, I think at this point it's as simple as just talking more. I don't think it's about. I mean, I think that. Companies are dealing with the natural laws of organizational physics, and I don't think there's anything you can do to catalyze that as far as like pushing without breaking something. However, if they open up, they talk more, they're more willing to describe their internal use cases, which and there's so many of them that I'm, I'm directly involved in, I think that you get more of a kind of a group think and a comfort around this. And so I think be open, participate in the community, and share your internal use cases. Martin, final question, because we've got a break. Just quickly summarize for the folks out there, why is this show so important? Why are we here? What is the future of networking? Why does it matter? What, what, what will accelerate? Just quickly share your quick summary of what, why this moment in time is so important. Yeah, I mean, I think we're definitely at an inflection point in the industry, and there are so many vectors that pushed on it, whether it was the mega data centers moving things to the application, or virtualization consuming ports into the software layer, or open flow catalyzing the discussion about decoupling the control plane, or OpenStack creating a network. There's so many vectors that have pushed on the industry, it's cracking. And when it cracks, change is going to happen. And so it's incumbent on us as a community to get together, to provide direction, to minimize the impact, and provide guidance. Because like, listen, the future, like, is, like okay, this is a cliche, but like, really, this is like, it's a future is ours to shape. We've got this in co mass of shattered networks that was created by all of these vectors, and now we need to provide some level of guidance. So like, we all need to be here, and we all need to participate, and we all need to be very clear about where we're going, and we should do it. Great opportunity, infancy of a revolution, a whole new dawn of great stuff happening. If you're a, an old incumbent, new incumbent, or new in entrant, great opportunity to be, dis to be a disruptor, great change. This is theCUBE, we're documenting and continuing our fifth year now. Thanks for coming on again, great to have you. Always great to have Martin on, sharing his knowledge. Very candid, uh, tech athlete. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back with our next guest. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. We'll be right back after this short break.